Jesus' death on the cross was not a defeat. It was God's plan. When Jesus died, he took the punishment for our sins to fix our broken relationship with God. Jesus promised something special would happen on the third day after he died. Sunday morning, some women went to put burial spices on Jesus' body. They knew a big stone was covering the tomb's entrance and wondered how they would move it. When they arrived, the stone had already been moved. Jesus' body was gone, and there were angels in the tomb. Jesus is alive, the angel said. Go tell his disciples. The woman told the disciples, and Peter and John ran to the tomb to see for themselves. All they found were Jesus' burial cloths and went back home confused. Later, the disciples were gathered together in a room. They were talking about what had happened. When Jesus appeared to them, they were terrified. They thought he was a ghost. Don't worry, said Jesus. See my hands and feet? It's me. Touch me. Go on. You can't touch a ghost. And ghosts don't eat either, but I'm feeling really hungry. So they ate some fish, and he taught them the scriptures are clear. He said the Messiah was supposed to to suffer and die, then be raised from the dead. Good morning again. We are so happy this morning. This is a great celebration. We're celebrating that Jesus rose from the dead. Like, come on now. Like, that. there's just, there's, it, it literally doesn't get better than that. That is the best news. We talk about the good news, that's the greatest news, right? And so, uh, we, we're starting to look at this new series. We're, we're, we're coming up with we called it the classics, right? And so each week we're going to have a different kid read us a story, and they did such a good. Andy did great. Everybody did great. I think Delaney is up next week, so that's going to be exciting. And then there's a whole bunch after that, right? Um, but they're going to read us the kid's version of the story, and then we're going to kind of explore it through our adult eyes or our grown-up perspective, right? Because there's so many stories from the Bible that almost everybody knows, even people who don't do church, right? But like, oh, Noah's Ark. Yeah, I've heard of that. Everybody's heard of Noah's Ark, right? But what do we really need to know from that? Well, today we're going to look at the resurrection because, hey, it's Easter, and that seems appropriate, right? But um, there are things that we really need to know from that beyond maybe just what Andy read for us. So, again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And if you're on Facebook Live this morning or if you're watching the recording later, hello to you as well. Thank you for participating in that way. Uh, and that's a reminder for you all, if you ever have to miss or if I get talking too fast or a slide goes away and you need to go back and review something, you can always go to our website, allabranchchapel.org, and refresh yourselves there. Happy Easter. Yes. Okay, so the thing about the Bible, it's... A true story. Sometimes it sounds too good to be true. Sometimes it sounds kind of crazy. And sometimes it's just downright ridiculous that God sent his son from heaven to earth who was born to the Virgin Mary who then lived as a man, was tempted by the devil but still didn't sin, and that then the Jews, his own people, had him executed by being put on a cross only to then find out three days later that he wasn't dead anymore and that that forgives our sins. If there's not something that's harder to swallow, I don't know what there is. And yet this is the most important event in all of history ever. And so we need to take a little bit closer look at that. 
In order to understand the resurrection, we do have to back up. And I kind of just paraphrased it, right? In the beginning was God. He created the universe. He created heaven. He created earth. He created animals. He created people. Everything was great for about five minutes. And then people began to disobey. We all have felt that in our heart at some point. We all have this urge, some of us more than others, right? But all of humanity has this urge to do our own thing, to try our own way, to just just even just bend the rules just a little bit. We've all, we've all got that, right? And some of us have got it a lot more than others, right? We're just flat out rebellious. You can't tell me what to do, right? Well, so we got Adam and Eve, and they feel this. They have a sinful nature, they sin. They break the perfection. They break the harmony of being in tune and in the presence of God because they disobeyed him. That's really all that sin is. Sin sounds bad and dark and scary, but guess what? It is. Because what it means is that we broke God's rules. We broke God's laws. Okay, now that sounds a little bit innocuous, right? The problem is God is so holy and so perfect that when we break those rules even a little bit, our relationship is severed. Think about when there's somebody that's important to you, somebody close, your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, kid, your parent, even a boss or a colleague, right? Somebody that you trust, somebody that you spend time with and you want to have this close relationship with. Any distrust in that relationship creates some barrier, right? Now, the greater the mistrust, the greater the barrier. But we all experience this even just amongst each other. So imagine the holy, perfect God who created everything, and then there's disobedience on our part. That's going to hinder and impede that relationship with God. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, it says, But your iniquities have made separation between you and your God, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. In other words, the sin put distance, space, a wall between the people and God. Well, that applied to the people that Isaiah was talking about in the Old Testament a long time ago, but it's also applicable to us now. When we have sin, it makes us less than holy, less than righteous, and that does not meet God's standards. In the New Testament, Paul writes it like this. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Well, he just kind of upped the ante a little bit, right? It was, hey, we just got a strained relationship, and now we've got, oh, we're supposed to die. Well, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, because sin against God is such a big deal, they would actually have to kill something to sacrifice in order to restore that relationship. So they would literally go get a cow or a chicken or other kind of animals, right? And they would take it to the temple, um, like the church building, right? And they would give it to the priest, and the priest would put it on the altar, and they would kill it, and then they would burn it, and the smoke with the aroma was supposed to be pleasing to the Lord, and that would wipe the slate clean for that particular thing. The problem was that didn't fix the human nature part. That didn't fix the sinful part. That just kind of gave us a fresh start. For the wages of sin is death. Something had to die. Blood had to be spilt, to be shed in order to take that. There was a price to be paid for the wrong. We're all very familiar with debt. We had a debt to pay. The debt was something had to die. That's why it's a heavy subject. That's why it's not just, oh, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Oh, you know, you, you're supposed to not be sinful. You know, just do 10% better this year. We're not doing a TED Talk. This is a serious thing, right? We, we've got a debt that has to be paid, and the payment was made through that sacrifice, and that atoned for the sin. And now atoned is a, a pretty churchy word. It's very specific. It means the relationship was reconciled. The debt was paid. But it was only temporary. Bec and just like in my life, and I would guess in your life, maybe only sometimes, right, you get 
forgiven and you feel good and you talk with God and I'm so sorry or you you know you you apologize to somebody in your life and you okay I'm not going to do that anymore I'm not going to lie or I'm not going to cheat or I'm not going to steal I'm not going to be mean to you anymore right and that lasts for only so long because we just can't quite keep it all together forever well and that's what would happen so more and more sacrifices had to be made these people are always going to the temple and doing all these things right but God was not satisfied with this barrier between him and humanity. He was not satisfied with all of this death. He was not satisfied with all of this bloodshed. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth. And that changed everything. Now, admittedly, this is a little hard to comprehend sometimes. It is a little bit hard to swallow that, wait, because there was sin in people, God sent his son to the earth, and that was supposed to make up for everything. Stick with me. It's okay. We're, we're going we're to get there. Jesus lived, so this is about 2,000 years ago, and he was born as a human. But the one key difference between us and Jesus, or just any other human in Jesus, was that he never sinned. He had the deity and the power of God, but he lived as a human. And even living as a human, he never sinned. He actually came face to face with the devil. He was out in the desert. He had been fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, and the devil comes up to him. Even in his moment of weakness, he held strong. He never gave in to the temptation. That's the difference, because we tend to give in. We can hold up for so long, and then something sneaks up on us. Or maybe we sneak up on something else, but we don't have that perfection. That's the difference. So when Jesus was killed on the cross, he served as the final sacrifice. You see, God had to have the sin atoned for. The debt existed. It was still there. But he wasn't satisfied with all the chickens and the goats and the cows and all of this system of just this constant back and forth, back and forth. So he said, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to do one sacrifice for everything, and it's going to take care of it. We're going to change the rules. We're going to change the system that we've got going on. So when Jesus went to the cross, his death satisfied that wage. Uh, so we actually only looked at the first part. So let's look at it again. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So by dying on the cross, Jesus took that wage of death. He took that penalty that was owed by humans. This is important to grasp because... Our entire faith system hinges on this concept. If this is not true, if, the, if sin doesn't lead to death, if sin is just, oh, make your own choices, or, you know, everybody can kind of do their own thing. You know, what works for you? I'm not going to judge you. You don't judge me. We just have this relativism, right, which is very common in our culture, right? We don't want to tell somebody they're wrong. We don't want to be told that we're wrong. It's just kind of whatever works for you, and, and, you know, we just leave each other alone about it. If that were true, then this is not. These are opposite concepts. For the wages of sin is death. The only way to overcome that wage of sin and death is Jesus Christ fulfilling that penalty for us. It's got to be one or the other. And so that brings us to the resurrection. What are the real implications of Jesus rising from the dead? First one. There we go. Jesus' resurrection shows that he conquered death. How did he conquer death? By not being dead anymore. Like, that's, I mean, it seems self-evident, but the resurrection showed us that he even had dominion over that. He was truly powerful and God himself. It also shows that God accepted the sacrifice. 
because through the power of God in Christ Jesus, the death was overcome. The wages of sin is death, but because we have Jesus, we get eternal life. So Jesus was the example of that. He was dead, but then he came back to eternal life because he didn't die again. He went straight up to heaven a few days later, right? So he, it shows us that not only did he not stay dead, but that the sacrifice was accepted. And because of that, we have regained our relationship with God. Our access has been restored. We don't have to go to the temple with a chicken. Jesus already did that for us. Because of the resurrection, everything is totally different. In Romans 6, 9, Paul writes, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion, I should say, over him. My bad. Because of the resurrection, we know this to be true. Next slide. Jesus' resurrection fulfills prophecy. In other words, the Old Testament scripture and even some New Testament scripture that was spoken before the act of the crucifixion and the resurrection. This had been expected for a very, very, very long time. For example, the prophet Hosea And chapter 6 says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. That's before Jesus was even born. That's That's hundreds of years ahead of time that the Jewish people have prophets saying, Hey, look. After two days, guess what? Sunday's coming. Guess what? It's not going to be death anymore. It's going to be the resurrection. Don't worry. This doesn't make any sense to you. We know this sounds like just magic or something ridiculous, but it will make sense someday. And Jesus fulfilled this exactly. Even in the New Testament, Matthew, one of the guys who walks around with Jesus, he wrote this down in chapter in verse, excuse me, chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. As they, meaning Jesus and the disciples, were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they went, Jesus, what are you talking about? But he knew that this was going to happen. Again, it didn't make sense at the time. Like, who? well, first of all, there's a little bit of question. Who the son of man? Why you need more names for yourself? What are you talking about, Jesus? And then you're going to die. And that sounds bad because we, you know, we quit our jobs for this and stuff. And uh, okay. And then what? On the third day, you're going to be raised? Like, are you going to like be floating around? What? What are you talking about? These are two of many examples. You could go read Isaiah 53. You could read Psalm 16. You could read the first chapter of John. And it's just full of Scripture that all points to this moment of history where our faith was changed forever. Next, Jesus' resurrection shows us that not only was the prophecy fulfilled, but the gospel specifically is true. When I say gospel, I'm talking about the record, the account, the story of Jesus. The part that Jesus was teaching, the things that he did on the earth. If he did not rise from the dead, we would probably not be too concerned with the stuff he did before that. Because he talked all the time about, hey, there's some changes going to be coming, and it's going to be confusing, and it's going to be scary, and it's going to be sad. But guess what? It's okay because I death can't hold me. Sin can't get me down, and life will go on for all of eternity. If he had just died and disappeared one day, that message would have fallen a little flat, don't you think? But because he did what he not only said was going to do, but the whole point of the story is that death is nothing to Jesus. That eternity is everything for all of us. That makes a huge difference. And so this just puts the exclamation point on the Jesus story. The gospel is true. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. In other words, hey, listen up. This is important. I told you this once. I'm going to tell you again. 
that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. We've been waiting for this, folks, and it finally happened. It changed everything, and there is nothing that we can do now that will take this away. There's nothing that we can do that we can add to the resurrection. There's nothing that could possibly be needed in addition to the resurrection. And so Paul goes around the whole world. He's preaching. He's planting church. And he goes, hey, I've told you all a ten times, a dozen times, a thousand times. It's all about Jesus overcoming sin, overcoming death, raising again on the third day, which fulfilled everything that we've been waiting for. Oh, by the way, that proves that Jesus was the Son of God. Because there ain't nobody else who could have done that. And even if they had, it wouldn't have had the same implications. It had to be the perfect sacrifice. It had to be God in his sinlessness, in his righteousness, in his holiness, in his perfection, and yet in his humanity where it was all so possible to go differently. Jesus not only allowed this, but chose this path. And because of that, we can see that he truly was the Son of God that he proclaimed. Romans 1.4 was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Because of his resurrection, we can believe that he truly was God. Great. Thank you, Nick. Great. It's all worked out now. We can put it down on paper. The resurrection happened, and life is important because of it. Good. Great, 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 great. We could, we could leave it there, right? But we'd be missing a, a key fact. Because this sounds pretty important, and I'm getting kind of excited about it, and I like preaching like this, right? And I like saying, hey, this is what Jesus did, and it changed the game, and it changed everything, right? But if it doesn't change my life specifically, if I don't walk away changed because of this information then we're just reading a story. We might as well just read Harry Potter. It's exciting, too. The question is, what does the resurrection mean for your life? Not, the, not your neighbors. Turn to your neighbor. Say, it means something for your life. Okay, now turn to your second choice. Say, it means something for your life. Preacher jokes, right? But now pull out your little mirror and say, it means something for my life. Jesus' resurrection shows that believers are united with Christ by faith. Very key. We are united with Christ by our faith. Why do we have believers' baptisms? Why do I insist that the very nervous people up here have to tell you who they are and why they want to get baptized, even though they'd much prefer I just tell it to you? Because it's by our faith. Nobody can live faith for you. Parents, you know that you try and try and try. You would love to be able to take it for them, right? And yet, you can't. You can lead by example. You can read the Bible. You can have all the late night talks that you can possibly have. But still, it comes down to every individual making their own step of faith towards Jesus. And so if you look at the resurrection as a historical event and go, wow, that's neat. We've missed it. You can think it's neat. I think it's neat. That's pretty cool, right? But if that's all it is, we've missed it. It has got to start your faith. You have to believe this, not only that it happened, but it happened for me and for you. Paul puts it a lot better than I do. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. And we don't hold them under too long. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life. If Jesus stayed dead, so would we. But Jesus raised from the dead, and by faith, so do we. When we put our faith in Jesus, we follow the Son of God who beat death and took our penalty for our sin. 
and that binds us not only with him, but when, with one another. I could have just prayed. Lindy could have just prayed. But no, what do we do? We all stand up together. We stick our hands out because we are being very intentional about saying we are all in this together. We know that this is not always easy. We know that let alone standing up here and talking with Pastor Nick is challenging enough. But beyond that, you have a whole life ahead of you of all kinds of challenges because nobody said that following Jesus was going to be easy or even fun. It might be dangerous. Have you heard of Sri Lanka? If you haven't been on the news this morning, they had bombings at multiple churches with hundreds dead and even more injured, all at Christian churches. Christianity is still the most persecuted religion in the world. It might look a little different in Russell, Kansas, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So when you walk by faith, you are being bound with Jesus and bound with the other believers for all of eternity. Very, very important. Don't miss that. Next, Jesus' resurrection gives us hope and a future. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's from 1 Peter chapter 1. We can't get rid of it. It's never going to perish. It's not going to spoil in the back of the fridge. Nobody can come and take it away from you. It lasts for all of eternity. This is not, oh, I'm 10 years old, or I'm 8 years old, or I'm 14 years old, or I'm 50 years old, or whatever it is, and, and I, I think this works for my life right now. This isn't a, you know, I, I, I'm missing something, and I, I just, I, I've tried a bunch of stuff. I'm going to try something new, and if this doesn't work, I'm going to try something else. And uh, that ain't it. If that's what you think you're doing, you're, you're not doing this. You're not following Jesus because this is an all-in, all-encompassing, eternity-changing, life-altering, not-a-moment event. But everything is different. We talk about the resurrection changing everything. Your faith in Jesus changes everything just like the resurrection. You are being resurrected by your faith. If not... What are we doing? Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I really should have read that more exciting. Hold on. Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. See, now we're going to preach. If the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, lives in me, I don't think tomorrow is going to be the same. I don't think any of my tomorrows could ever be the same. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's what Paul is saying. That's what all of them say. That's what the prophets from way back have said for thousands of years, have been waiting for this thing to happen because nothing will ever be the same. The Spirit of God who let Jesus die in agony and then let him go to his death and then three days later raised him from the dead to then walk around and go, yep, Thomas, you don't believe me? Check that out right there. That's a good story. You should go look that one up. Go look, just Google Doubting Thomas. It'll be fun. All right. So if that doesn't change things, nothing is going to. What you're looking for doesn't exist. If that doesn't cut it, if that doesn't hit you in your heart, if that doesn't give you faith, then we're just going to have to pray for you some more because that's the only thing that's coming. The Holy Spirit is eventually going to get through that hard heart or that wickedness or that doubt or whatever it is that is holding you back. It's the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the death can certainly raise you out of whatever's holding you back can cure that addiction, can cure that disease, or at least give you peace with what you're walking through because Jesus is with you. Because, yes, our bodies will fail. Some of us earlier than it should be. Some of us later than makes sense. We don't get it. But all of us will die in these bodies. But the faith in Jesus brings us to resurrection of new life for all of eternity with God in heaven. And that sounds pretty good. 
And finally, finally, Jesus' resurrection gives us a calling. And I know, it's a bunch of scripture. It's, it's, it's bullet points, right? We're working through it. But you know what? If there's anything, if there's anything that you take from this morning, if there's anything that you take here from this morning, is that the resurrection changed everything and you have a response to it. Your choice is, am I going to step in faith or am I going to continue to live without? Am I going to take this step of faith even though it doesn't all make sense? Because we've already established it's kind of crazy. If it made sense, would it really be that valuable though? But regardless, your, the resurrection requires you to decide what you're going to do with it. You can ignore it. You can pretend it's not there. You can treat it as historical accuracy. You can treat it as historical fiction. You can say, oh, those wacky Christians got fooled again. Fine. You're not going to take anything away from me. But you have the individual choice of whether you're going to do faith. And if you're going to do faith, then it gives you a calling. Be being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. This is at the day of Pentecost. Peter was accused of being drunk. Peter was accused of being a wacko. Peter was accused of many things. And yet, the Spirit of God is speaking through him at the greatest preaching ever done except by Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit makes his appearance known for the first time. Jesus, before he died, said, hey, y'all are going to do some amazing things. I got to go. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He's going to do some great things through you and with you and for you. But don't do anything without him. Wait for him. Well, guess what? When he finally shows up, this is what Peter says. Because Jesus is exalted, because he's sitting on his throne at the right hand of God, because he did what he said he was going to do, and he went to the Father and said, Hey, God, hey, Daddy, I'm home. These people are going to need some more help. I've been there. I lived with them for a little while. They, they, we're going to have to do something to help them out. We're going to send them the Holy Spirit. Father God said, All right, here we go. So then in Acts chapter 2, he sends them the Holy Spirit. It's poured out, and they do all kinds of miraculous things even just by speaking. Back up a couple steps. Remember that very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the cause of the resurrection, the one who powered the resurrection? That's the spirit that now lives in us as believers. That's good. That's exciting. How does that give us a calling, Nick? You said this is about calling. John 11 says, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Okay, Nick, that's good news. We've kind of been through that. Where's the calling part? In Matthew chapter 28, we have what's called the Great Commission. Jesus has gathered his disciples. They are hanging out. He is teaching them some stuff, and he's like, I got to go. I'm done. I've done everything I can do with you guys. You know how it is with your kids. Like, you know what? Your hair is what it is, and the lunch is in the bag. You're going to school the way you are. It doesn't matter. The other moms will get it. It's okay. Right? Jesus says, I got to go. I'm done with this. I've been killed. I'm tired of this. I slept for three days. I was dead, and now I'm alive, and I've done this, and we had dinner, and we ate some fish. (sighs) I'm done. I'm ready to go. You know what he says right before he literally floats himself up to heaven? You know what he says? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Say this with me. Go. Okay, say it after me. Fine. Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples... We use that word around here a lot, don't we? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I did not make that part up. And teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Bye-bye. Off he goes. The last thing Jesus says, the last words uttered out of his mouth are the instructions for what we are supposed to do. Hey, y'all, 
I meant this. We've been talking about this for a couple years now. They killed me for it. I decided that wasn't good enough. I rose from the dead. We have the resurrection. We had breakfast. Now I'm ready to go home. Go ahead and keep doing what I taught you. Go tell everybody that you will listen and even the ones who won't listen about me. Go teach them what I taught you. Baptize them. And do it. And do it. And do it. And keep going. And do it some more. And do it. And then when you die, I'll raise you from the dead. Deal? That's our that's that's it. That's the calling. The resurrection changes history, changes our perspective, changes who we are, but also changes what we do. Changes our entire purpose. It changes our focus on everything because, let's be honest, I love thinking about myself. I love thinking about how I feel about things, what I think about things, how I would do things if I was in charge, and if I am in charge, what I am going to do about things. And, man, oh, man, what are they thinking about me? Or what are they thinking about me and what the choices that I made? And, oh, is the selfie good enough? Or uh, do I get enough likes? Or, oh, man, that video. Ooh, I am not a video editor, but, you know, we're going to get there. And, hey, you know, preaching, eh, we can do okay. And, oh, we're going to sing that song, but as long as I don't have to sing very loud. Or, oh, I had to tuck my shirt in for Easter. And I'm thinking about me and me and me and me and me. And you're thinking about you and you and you and you and you. We should write a country song. But we have to fight against that. Fight against that selfishness, that pride, that sin, that sinful nature within us. And instead, focus on the resurrection and not only what Jesus did and what the Holy Spirit did, but what is yet to come through us in us, for us, by us, around us. It's all about Jesus raising from the dead. Who did that? The Holy Spirit. Who lives in us as believers? If we have faith in Jesus, we get the Holy Spirit. Why do we have the Holy Spirit? Because the work is not done. Jesus is taking a break. He's going to come back. It's going to be awesome. But until then, the Holy Spirit is at work through us. The resurrection changes everything. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We celebrate you. We love you. We are impressed. Color me impressed, Lord. Raising Jesus from the dead. Uh, uh, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for new life. Thank you for something to follow. Thank you for something to put our faith in. Thank you for being real to us. Thank you for restoring that relationship. And if I say that, I have have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you had to pay the penalty for my sin. I can't even focus on that. I'm so overwhelmed that you did it. I'm so overjoyed that you would take that penalty and pay my debt. And all that you ask for in exchange is the rest of my life. And you're going to give me the rest of eternity. Man, you've been on the short end of a couple deals this week, Lord. Lord, I thank you so much. I pray for the strength to carry your mission forward. I pray for the boldness and the courage to live my faith in a way that represents you well. I pray that I can serve and that I can love others in a way that points them to you. And I thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've already done through your resurrection. Y'all, if this is a new concept for you, again, I admit, it might be hard to swallow. That's okay. If you feel that Jesus is tugging at your heart, There is no special thing that you have to do. We don't do paperwork to put people in water. You certainly don't have to do paperwork to put your faith in Jesus. There's not a special thing you have to pray. It's whatever's on your heart, whatever's in your words. There's not something that you exactly have to do exactly the right way. You put your faith in Jesus, and you do your best by the power of the Holy Spirit to follow him. If you're wanting to make that step, it's a baby step. And if you think it's going to be perfect from here on out, you're looking at the wrong preacher, that's for sure. But there's nothing that will change your life 
more than the resurrection of Jesus resurrecting you. So I would pray for you, Lord, that you would just touch these people's hearts, that you would open them up to your spirit, to your love, to your reality, to your truth, that they would feel the courage to step out of the unknown, to step into the scary faith life with you, Lord. There are no right words. There are no wrong words. As long as it's about putting faith in you, they can just say, God, I'm confused, but I'm going to try following you. Say, Jesus, I accept that you resurrected from the dead and that it's paying my debt. That's what faith is. And Lord, I just pray for the courage for everybody here to take that faith step, whether it's the first time they've heard that, whether it's the first time they've even considered it, whether it's the hundredth or the thousandth time, and they think that, oh, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to make it there. I'm never going to get there. But instead, we know the truth, Lord, that you can overcome death. You can overcome whatever we're facing. So, Lord, I pray, as I have prayed so many times, for more faith in you. I pray that I can have faith in you, Jesus, and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, more people can as well. In Jesus' name I pray.